Today on Vatican Connections, we take a look at papal travel then and now. The Secretariat of Communications releases its theme for the next World Day of Social Communications, and Pope Francis remembers Shimon Peres. Hello and welcome to Vatican Connections, I'm Emily Callan. The Holy Father sent three delegates to attend the funeral of former Israeli President Shimon Peres in Jerusalem today. Vatican spokesperson Craig Burke confirmed the presence of the former Apostolic Nuncio to Israel, Archbishop Antonio Franco, its current Nuncio, Archbishop Giuseppe Lazzarotto, and Councillor of the Apostolic Nunciature, Monsignor Matteo de Mori. On Wednesday, Pope Francis had sent his condolences to the President of Israel, Reuven Rivlin, following the death of Shimon Peres, former Israeli president, saying, I hope that his memory and many years of service will inspire us all to work with even greater urgency for peace and reconciliation between peoples. He also recalled his meetings with Mr. Perez with fondness. In fact, the former president's most recent visit was last June at the Vatican. Their meeting took place in the Vatican Gardens with Patriarch Bartholomew I of Constantinople and President of Palestine Mahmoud Abbas. During their encounter, Shimon Perez spoke of peace. He acknowledged that peace doesn't come easy. He said it can seem distant, but that we must pursue it to bring it close. Shimon Perez died at the age of 93. Fear not, I am with you, communicating hope and trust in our time. Such is the theme for the next World Day for Social Communications, announced on Thursday by the Secretariat for Communications. The theme is inspired by a passage from Isaiah. The Secretariat explains that our current ways of communicating can often ignore men and women in places of deprivation and poverty or create looming fears and dangers. It therefore wants to invite us to be a light in dark places and to tell the history of the world and the histories of men and women in accordance with the logic of the good news that reminds us that God never ceases to be a father. The 51st World Day of Social Communications will be marked on January 24, 2017, Feast Day of St. Francis de Sales, who is also the patron saint of journalists. Members of the Pontifical Council Cor Unum, who work in Syria and Iraq, had an audience with the Pope on Thursday at Clementine Hall at the Vatican. Cor Unum is the Pope's humanitarian arm around the world, and he spoke to 100 delegates of various agencies and organizations affiliated to the Council, and spoke of the importance of safeguarding the dignity of those affected by conflicts in these countries, especially refugees. Despite extensive efforts made in a variety of areas, the logic of arms and oppression, hidden interests and violence continues to wreak devastation on these countries and that even now we have not been able to put an end to the exasperating suffering and repeated violations of human rights. Such was the way the Holy Father began his address after greeting everyone present as well as Mr. Stefan de Mistura, special UN envoy to Syria. He spoke of violence which begets so many other evils, arrogance, inertia, abuses of power and revenge. Why does man continue to pursue these evils, the Pope asked. That is why man needs to be redeemed. He came back to the year of mercy, which offers man the opportunity to look to Jesus. And he recalled the words of John Paul II, who said, evil reaches its limit when faced with the divine mercy. And then he turned to the members gathered and told them they are a reflection of God's mercy on the ground where such violence takes place. Beyond the necessary humanitarian aid, what our brothers and sisters in Syria and Iraq want more than anything else today, he added, is peace. Pope Francis renewed his appeal for continued efforts towards peace, and finally he entrusted their work to the intercession of St. Teresa of Calcutta, exemplar of charity and mercy. Last Friday, Pope Francis gave his usual catechesis on the theme of mercy, focusing on the story of the good thief at the crucifixion, who recognized Jesus as one who forgives and saves. God's salvation is for everyone, the Pope said, 
anyone who repents. Here is a summary of the pontiff's catechesis. Dear brothers and sisters, Jesus' words during his passion culminate in forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. For the good thief, these are not mere words, for Jesus truly forgives him. For the bad thief, however, it is inconceivable that the Messiah would remain on the cross and not save himself. But it is precisely by remaining on the cross that Jesus offers salvation to every person regardless of their situation. This Jubilee year is a time of grace and mercy for all, the good and the bad, those in health and those who suffer. It is a time to remember that nothing can separate us from the love of God. To all those sick in hospital, who live within the walls of a prison, who are trapped by war, we are called to look to Christ crucified on the cross, who is God with us, who remains with us on the cross, and who offers himself to us as a savior. The good thief helps us to understand how we should approach God with awe and not fear, with respect for God's power and infinite goodness. When we approach him in this way, we entrust ourselves to his mercy, even in the darkest moments. For God is always with us sinners, and he loves us even to death on the cross. Let us see in the good thief a model of confidence in the Lord, and like him, let us call upon Jesus' name and ask him to remember us in paradise. At the end of his catechesis, the Pope called upon the conscience of those responsible for bombings in Syria, for they will be accountable to God. His appeal came after the news of a ceasefire failing in Aleppo and where bombardments have continued in the city. The Holy Father shared his concern for the fate of Aleppo's population and thousands who are stuck in the middle of the violence are without basic necessities. He stressed that everyone should commit with all of their strength to the protection of civilians as a mandatory and urgent obligation. A peace agreement was reached on Monday between the Colombian government and rebels of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia after years of conflict in the country, a conflict which killed 220,000 people and displaced close to 5 million. Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Perlin was in Cartagena, Colombia on Monday, where the agreement was signed. At a prayer service earlier in the day, attended by heads of states and some 2,500 Colombians, he spoke to those present at St. Peter Clavier Church, saying the agreement to end Latin America's last armed conflict is the start of a process of positive change for the country. He added, Colombia should begin to ease the pain of so many of its people by working to build a better future and by rebuilding the dignity of those who have suffered. Though an agreement was signed last Monday, a referendum will be held next Sunday where Colombians will vote for it or against it. Last Sunday, catechists got to celebrate their jubilee in Rome and celebrate Mass with the Pope. 30,000 catechists from around the world took part in the jubilee celebrations, which began last Friday. Catechists had the opportunity to participate in Eucharistic Adoration, the Sacrament of Reconciliation, and do a pilgrimage through the Holy Door. At the Sunday Mass, the Holy Father gave the homily and asked them to always proclaim the main message of faith, that Christ is risen. Here is an excerpt of his homily. On this jubilee of catechists, we are being asked to not tire of keeping the key message of the faith front and center. The Lord is risen. Nothing is more important, nothing is clearer or more relevant than this. Everything in the faith becomes beautiful when linked to this centerpiece, if it is saturated by the Paschal Proclamation. 
But if it remains in isolation, it loses its sense and force. We are called always to live out and proclaim the newness of the Lord's love. Jesus truly loves you just as you are. Give him space in spite of the disappointments and wounds in your life. Give him the chance to love you. He will not disappoint you. Following the Mass, the Pope addressed the crowds once again for the traditional prayer of the Angelus, this time offering special intentions for Mexico, where kidnapping and murder of clergy members is a growing concern, especially in areas afflicted by drug wars and organized crime. Last weekend alone, three priests were found dead. Cari fratelli e sorelle. Pope Francis offered prayers for slain Mexican priests on Sunday and put his support behind the ongoing pro-family and pro-life efforts of the Mexican bishops. Speaking to the faithful gathered in St. Peter's Square on Sunday ahead of the noonday Angelus prayer, he also recalled the beatification which took place in the German city of Würzburg on Saturday of the servant of God, Father Engelmar and Zeitig, a Czech-born priest who ministered in Austria and was martyred in the Nazi concentration camp in Dachau. Pope Francis said, I assure my prayers for the dear Mexican people that the violence which has in recent days reached even several priests might cease. In conclusion, Pope Francis recalled the World Day of the Deaf and offered prayers and encouragement to deaf people everywhere. I want to salute all deaf persons, he said, and encourage them to give their part for a church and for a society that are both ever more ready and willing to welcome everyone. On Saturday, the Holy Father met with families of victims of the terror attack in Nice, which took place last July. The audience was held in Paul VI Hall at the Vatican, and close to 1,000 were gathered. The Pope greeted them as he walked in and addressed the crowd, offering once again his condolences and prayers. Pope Francis, during a private audience on Saturday, caressed the picture of a little girl who died during the massacre on the banks of the Tyr River in Nice, France, on July 14th. He embraced another little girl who lost a parent that night and shook the hand of an emotional Muslim lady who cried over her dead loved one, killed by the blind violence of one who claimed to be a follower of Allah. At the end of the audience in the Paul VI Hall, Pope Francis personally greeted one by one all affected by the violence, which he said cared neither for the origin nor religion. Shortly before in his speech, the Pope called on the Heavenly Father to receive the dead in the joy of eternal life. May this certainty which belongs to Christians and the believers of other religions, the Pope said, console you throughout your life. He also prayed for the injured, assuring them of the church's closeness and asking that the Lord put in your hearts feelings of peace and brotherhood. The Holy Father then thanked all those who helped the victims on that fateful day, many of whom belonged to different religions. Fervid interreligious relations like those at Nice can contribute to relieving the wounded of body and soul. For this reason, Pope Francis recalled the urgent priority with which political and religious leaders must favor sincere dialogue and fraternal relations between all believers, especially among those who confess a single and merciful God. Quando la tentazione di ripiegarsi su se stessi, oppure di rispondere all'odio con l'odio, he said, when the temptation is great to close in on oneself or to respond to hate with hate and violence, an authentic conversion of heart is necessary. This is the message of the gospel which Jesus directs at each of us. The Holy Father concluded saying, we can respond to the demon's attacks only with the works of God, which are forgiveness, love, and respect for our neighbors, even if they are indifferent. <laughs> Today, Pope Francis made his way to Georgia and Azerbaijan. His three-day apostolic trip begins in the capital of Georgia, where he is meeting the President of the Republic and scheduled to give his usual address to the diplomatic corps and civil authorities. The Holy Father will also be meeting with the Orthodox leaders, Syro-Chaldean bishops, Catholic priests, 
bishops and seminarians and celebrate mass alongside a delegation of the Orthodox Patriarchate. And Azerbaijan's final day will begin with mass in a small Catholic church before greeting the Muslim leader and later participate in an interfaith meeting. It is the Pope's second time in the Caucasian region, but what motivated his choice? And what is the social and political context of his trip to Georgia and Azerbaijan? Well, peace be with you is the theme of the Pope's trip to Georgia and Azerbaijan. It is his 16th voyage outside of Italy, and he is going to a region where Catholics are a minority. In Georgia, Catholics make up 1% of the population, while Muslims make up 10% and Orthodox Christians 87%. In Azerbaijan, the religious majority is Muslim by 97%. Conscious of this reality, the Pope shared in a communique that he had two objectives with regards to this trip. First, to highlight the ancient Christian heritage found in these lands and encourage peace. Vatican spokesperson Craig Burke stressed that the Pope will carry with him a message of reconciliation for the whole region. The meeting has an ecumenical and interreligious dimension. But other challenges present themselves in order to find peace in Georgia and Azerbaijan, namely the ongoing conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, another country the Pope visited last June. These two republics have been fighting over an Armenian province governed by Azerbaijan, which the Armenians claim to be theirs. A ceasefire was imposed at the end of the 20th century, but violent tensions between both countries continued. During his trip to Armenia, Pope Francis appealed to both states to find a solution to the conflict. A delicate voyage then because of political tensions in these regions of the Caucasus. But in his in-flight press conference last June, after completing his trip in Armenia, the Argentinian Pope insisted that he would speak of truth to the people of Azerbaijan. He would talk of what he saw and of what he felt while in Armenia. For Catholics in that region, they hope that the Pope's visit would strengthen their faith and their hope of a greater harmony. It is the second time that a Pope makes his way to both countries. John Paul II completed a trip to Georgia in 1999 and to Azerbaijan in 2002. This past week mark one year since the Holy Father's trip to the U.S. and Cuba. A trip which also included the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia to which he participated at the end of his voyage. His week-long stay in both countries included an historic flight between two newly reconciled countries, addresses to Congress and the UN, a canonization and several memorable visits with religious, prisoners, students and families. One Canadian bishop recalls the Pope's visit to America in particular and what struck him most from what the Holy Father said. What has caught me, my attention most of all is all what he's, he's said about the family. And you know, the day, the day before, while well, he came with all these kinds of family coming from uh, different parts of the world and with different... And while well, I, I was convinced, but while well, my conviction is a lot stronger now, that family is really, you know, at the center, the reality. The reality of the church, of the society. So we have... I think, and the Pope, well, with the two synods and so on, and all what he's saying about family life, uh, I think he's also convinced of that. This is where we have to work and involve, you know, lots, all what we have, uh, involve our heart so that the family is going to regain energy and regain its place in the church and in the society. One of the things which I have in my heart is the testimony of uh, a family, or the couple and their kid, who were, well, the night before the Mass. And they were among all these people, you know, and the Pope passed, and they had, well, the impression, but probably he looked at them, and they were so touched by that. And she was the person in charge of family life in the diocese. And this gave her, you know, a boost. 
and uh, sorely while well, she's she's going through cancer and things like that but last year she was just moving everything in favor of family i'm very thankful to the uh, the diocese of philadelphia because they offered us for two couples you know to get there so while we are a poor diocese and we would probably not have been able to do that uh, and i had the opportunity to thank uh, bishop chapeau this is what we need uh, many people are saying that we need to call back all the people who have left the church well i'm not against that but i think that in a in a way what we are doing what we have to do it's the foundation of a new church. It could be smaller, as Benedict used to say, but at the center, at the foundation, the basis is family. So while what a visit like that does is to help us to be, well, uh, sure that this is the right way to go, and it helps a lot with the people, to convince the people. I must say that the first time I spoke about family in my diocese, people were not very convinced. Now they are. We cannot speak of the Pope's trip to the U.S. without going back to his time spent in Cuba. He chose to carry out both itineraries at the same time. Now looking back, what prompted the Holy Father to do so, and what have been the repercussions of his visit to Cuba? Matteo Ciofi helps us answer these questions. In the four days spent on the island, the pontiff visited several cities, Havana, Holguin and Santiago, leaving a message of hope anywhere. The contribution of the Holy Father in the reestablishment of relations between Cuba and the United States after 50 years is undeniable, thanks to the commitment of many figures, including Archbishop Becho, substitute for general affairs to the Secretary of State, and Cardinal Jaime Ortega, Archbishop of Havana. Through several interpreters, the two countries are now ready to write a new page in their history and their relationships. The U.S. president admitted his guilt regarding relations with Cuba. Raul Castro did not close the door, and Pope Francis has followed the case closely with the hope that everything would go in the right direction. Just in Holguin, during his second day in Cuba, the Pope encouraged Cubans to live as a community, to care for one another, a clear message in the Raul and Fidel Castro province of origin. With the leader Maximum, the Pope had a private meeting, two figures so distant and at the same time so close not only for their Jesuit education, but above all, for having always put at the center of their lives attention to the poor and for social justice. In the Pope's visit to Cuba, the Church benefited from being seen as a social factor of integration, as a backbone of patriotic values rooted in Catholic faith, for it strived to be voice of the voiceless. At the same time, the average believer of any faith felt the desire to get rid of all the fears that weighed on religious expression for so long. The subsequent departure of the Pope to the United States created an additional and ideal bond between the two countries, but above all confirmed the will of Pope Francis to give a new impetus to certain relationships following his principle to build bridges and not barriers. Cuba in this way became the stage a few months later, last February, for another type of rapprochement. The Pope went directly to Mexico, stopping in Havana to meet with the Patriarch of Moscow, Kirill I, and even long anticipated since the Great Schism of 1054 between the Church of the West and of the East. Finally, we are brothers, the pontiff exclaimed at the end of the meeting. It was an historical moment which took place in Cuba, the new land of dialogue and reconciliation for the Church and beyond. Did you know, Pope Paul VI was the first pope to travel outside of Europe and the first to do so by airplane in 1964 for a trip to the Holy Land. It was also the first time a pope traveled to the Holy Land. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send them via Vatican Connections Twitter page at Vati Connections. I'll be happy to answer them on our next episode. That's all for tonight. Thanks for watching, take care and God bless.